boy, oh boy, did we get into a thorny issue this past Lord's Day, so you might want to stick around for a few minutes and find out more from God's Word. My name is David Miller, and I'm the pastor of membership here at McGregor, and this is Beyond the Notes. Okay, okay, if you were with us this past Sunday, you know that what I just said was a really, really bad dad joke. And I can't help myself because I'm 54 years old and I'm a dad, so live with it. And yes, this past Sunday we did look at a thorny issue because we looked at the Apostle Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians, beginning in verse 5, going through uh, uh, verse 10. And in that passage, Paul is essentially describing how the sovereignty of God works in relationship to human suffering. And he uses one particular affliction from his own life, his thorn, as he calls it, as an example of how God works. And as I said on Sunday, we don't know the specifics of what the thorn was, but we know it was a painful, ongoing affliction that brought about suffering into Paul's life. And of course, I did not sufficiently cover the topic of God's sovereignty and human suffering because it's a massive one, and there's always an element of mystery to the ways of God, and we must acknowledge that, and we certainly must be humbled by that. So today on the podcast, what I'd like to do is just keep things simple, and I want to point out a pattern in Scripture that may be helpful for us to think about before the next season of suffering hits you or me. Quite often we say around here at McGregor, you you better learn in the light what you're going to need in the dark. So let's do that together. Because providentially, I didn't start thinking about Uh, both the extent of and the mechanics of God's suffering over God's sovereignty over human suffering until about 19 years ago. And my grand conclusion about the interplay between the two of those things is that it's a mystery. And yet God uses our suffering to sanctify us. And I'll admit, I'm still not completely comfortable attaching God's control over all things with outcomes that I don't like or things that bring me great sorrow. Yet I find encouragement in the scriptures because of how God works in suffering. As I mentioned earlier, there's a pattern of God's behavior, if you will, that is encouraging to me, and I hope it will be to you as well. And the pattern is this. What God does is he declares his sovereignty and he invites us to trust in him. Take Moses, for example, in the Old Testament. I see Moses complaining about uh, his own physical disability in speech, and he's complaining to God about that. And God's response to him in Exodus chapter 4, verse 11 was, who made man's mouth? Who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? That's a rhetorical question with a very clear answer of yes, it is the Lord who does all of that. God's not explaining himself to Moses in Exodus 4. He's simply declaring his sovereignty and he's inviting Moses to trust in him. I also see Job asking God about his own suffering and God's response to Job was in Job 38 verse 4, was where were you when I formed the foundations of the earth? Again, a rhetorical question from God where Job's answer has to be, uh, I wasn't there, God. And Job doesn't walk away from that conversation with God saying, oh, I get it. I understand perfectly well now why I'm suffering. It all makes sense. No, God just declares his sovereignty to Job and invites Job to trust in him. I also see the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 45, 9, a verse I referenced uh, this past Sunday that says, Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him who is but a pot shard among the pot shards on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Another rhetorical question, but the clear answer this time is no. The clay has no right to question how the potter shapes the clay. That's the potter's job. He's the potter. He's sovereign over the clay. And so the clay must trust in what the potter is doing. 
And though there are many other examples in the Bible, I'll give you just one last one. It's in John 9. And in John 9, I see Jesus responding to an inconsiderate question the disciples ask him about a blind beggar who none of them actually thought was a legitimate person. And Jesus' beautiful answer when he says of the man born blind in John 9, uh, verse 3, is this. It was not that this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. The disciples' was question, question was, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, it was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Friends, in that moment, the second person of the Trinity declares his sovereignty, and he invites his disciples and the blind man to trust in him. See, God has a redemptive and sovereign purpose for every single event in our life, whether we can grasp that purpose or not. And most of the time, friends, we won't, not fully grasp it anyway, not this side of heaven. Honestly, just like all these other people that I mentioned in the scriptures, you and I have no choice but to file our suffering under God's sovereignty because he understands things we just don't. He orchestrates things we would never connect to each other. And he can take every circumstance in our life and bring both our good and his glory out of those circumstances. I don't fully understand how he does that. But I do know that he's never apologized to me for his orchestration in my life. Yet in his grace to me, he consistently declares his sovereignty and he invites me and you to trust in him. I do hope that encourages you today. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit the like button or the subscribe button or the share button or all three. And before we go, if you want to be ready for next Sunday's sermon, we'll be moving on to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 11, going all the way through verse 19. So feel free to read ahead. God bless and have a good week.